Hi there, welcome you to this digital mode of learning. In my previous video, we started talking on the antigen antibody interaction and we discussed on how antibodies are generated for the diagnostic purpose and what is the principle behind any immunological essay. What we would be talking in this video is about the two most uh, used immunological essays that are being classified into two branches that is immunoprecipitation and agglutination assays. In the very previous video, we did talk about cross-linking and cross-reactivity. We would be again talking it or talking about it before we lead into the immunoprecipitation and agglutination essays. Now, one need to keep in mind whenever he or she is performing an immunological essay is the cross-reactivity. Now, what is cross-reactivity? Cross-reactivity is basically a phenomena that arises when a antibody generated against a particular kind of an antigen makes or when a person sees that a same antibody is getting binded to more than one type of antigen. What we mean to say is it may happen that a single antibody may bind to more than one type of antigen. There may be a related antigen against which the antibody has been developed to which we believe the antibody should bind and it does bind. But that same antibody may bind to an unrelated antigen as well. When such a phenomena arises, we call this phenomena as cross-reactivity. Now, why this comes into, the, uh, in, in, into nature? Because two antigens may have an homologous type of an epitope. The epitope may be of the structural origin or may be sequential in origin, but two antigens may share same type of an epitopic region. Because of the presence of the same type of epitopic region, a single type of an antibody may either or may, may bind to more than one type of an antigen. However, the binding to an unrelated pro epitopic, uh, unrelated antigen is always less. What it, what it means is that the antibody may not remain bind or the binding may not be that much efficient to an unrelated antigen, but the uh, binding of the antibody to the related antigen is always very high. So one need to keep in mind because many of the vaccines that are being created does show cross reactivity so one need to call keeps in mind the issue of cross reactivity whenever performing any immunological essay we will start talking about the immunoprecipitation reaction now we said that there are two types of an essays immunological essays are being classified into two types that is the uh, precipitation reaction and the agglutination reaction Whenever we talk about a precipitation reaction, what we mean is the aggregation of antigen and antibody occurs when the antigen is in the soluble form. Such aggregation or such immunological assay is known as the precipitation reaction. I repeat it again. If the antigen is in the soluble form, then the, in, and the aggregation caused due to antigen and antibody interaction is called as the precipitation reaction reaction and the antibody that is doing this particular job is called as a precipitin that is when an antibody is able to bind to a soluble form of, of, of an antigen the antibody is called as a precipitin now before talking on what are the different essays or techniques available for the such kind of, of immunoprecipitation type of reactions let's talk about the uh, phenomena on which the uh, aggregation or cross-linking depends, because cross-linking is one of is one of the very major factor that is should be there while doing any immunological assay to find out the result. If the cross-linking is not there, then the result won't be visible or the result won't be can be understood. Right. So. 
for cross linking to occur there there are two basic uh, 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 principles that are should be there principal factor should be there number one is that the antibody should be multivalent or bivalent in nature when we say it should be bivalent in nature or multivalent in nature what we mean to say is that each unit of an antibody should be able to bind to more than one antigen i repeat every antibody or any one antibody should have the capacity of binding to more than one antigen because if it could bind to more than i have more than one antigen then definitely it would be causing the cross linking in a similar manner even the antigen should have more than one epitopic region that is recognizable by the antibody so that a single uh, many types of antibodies can bind with because this comes into the uh, scene whenever we are talking about the polyclonal antibodies right so polyclonal antibodies are generated against the different types of epitope present over the same antigen so if an antigen has more than one epitopic region we call that sir antigen should, is, is being called as a bivalent or multivalent and it is also very necessary for making the cross linkings available in the due process so these two things are kept in mind whenever we are doing the immunological assays right so let's talk about uh, start talking about the precipitation reaction that occurs in gel in general laboratory in your uh, classes or during their practical classes you may have come across two very general techniques that are basically a kit based techniques which are called as a radial immuno diffusion and the ocholoni double diffusion now both of these immunological assays or immuno precipitation based assays are the reactions that are yielded in a gel and whenever you do this in a gel you can see a human visible precipitin lines right so let's start talking about uh, first the radial immunodiffusion now when we talk about the radial immunodiffusion what we do is we take an hydrose gel and in the gel you add the antigen and you may and you then you develop the wells within the uh, uh, within the gel and when you develop the gels uh, well within the gel uh, you add the antibodies to it and the antibodies they diffuse to the surrounding region and whenever they diffuse to the surrounding region they when when a region is being recognized as Uh, the zone of equivalence in that zone of equivalence region what you will see is the development of the precipitin uh, lines now these lines are in in the radial immunodiffusion is in the form of a circle and the size of the circle basically determines the concentration of the antigen right so radial immunodiffusion is basically conducted to know either the concentration of the antibody or the concentration of the antigen now whose concentration you want to determine whether it may be an antibody or an antigen the component whose concentration is to be determined has to be always added in the well right so you need to keep if you want to uh, understand the concentration determine the concentration of an antibody you must add it in the well or you want to determine the concentration of the antigen you add the antigen inside the well and it's uh antagonist you are added in the uh the chip right in the same way there is another method which is called as ocholoni double diffusion now when we talk about ocholoni double diffusion in this you as you can see in the diagram just below where the, where, where you can see the ocholoni double diffusion you see that there is a triangle way of arranging the wells now you again make a gel and in the gel you make three uh uh wells in a triangular Uh, edges and in the later in the in the parallel uh, parallel uh, wells you add either say here in the case you add the antigen and in the upper edge you add the antibody now you do this thing and uh, when we do that particular thing now what happens here both the antigen and antibody both diffuse that's why the how it the word uh, it gets as double diffusion in the radial immunodiffusion it is only one of the component either the antigen or the antibody provided what you are adding inside the well is getting diffused but in the ocholoni double diffusion both the antigen and antibody they diffuse towards each other now when they diffuse towards each other they meet to a point of zone of equivalence and they produce the precipitin line 
Now the pattern of the precipitant lines give us an information about the homology of the two types of antigen. Now say suppose there is an antigen which you suspect may be of a particular nature but you that is just an hypothesis and you want to confirm that this antigen is of this particular nature. So what you do is uh, say suppose you say this antigen is from this particular uh, because of this particular infection and you take a similar antigen which you are actually believing. So if the, both the antigens are same in nature now what will happen is the precipitant line will always show the same type of pattern right and we call that pattern as a pattern of identity if there is a subtle difference between the two antigens that is they say subtle difference in their epitopic region then they would show a partial identity and if there is exactly the two antigens are totally different from each other then definitely they will not show the same type of pattern and you will get a pattern of non-identity so you can actually use a gel based system of immunoprecipitation to identify whether the two antigens are of same type or not right now the another way of doing immunoprecipitation reaction if you want to use immunoprecipitation for the uh, for identifying the presence and absence of a protein you can use uh, the gel based system for doing so now in the immuno uh, electrophoresis method what you do is just like a general electrophoresis you make a agarose gel and in the agarose gel what you add up in the wells uh, is the antigens and after anti the uh, after adding the antigens you do the electrophoresis now based upon their size the different antigens will separate in the gel and once their separation has been achieved you develop a trough just parallel to the separation uh, bands of the antigens now in the trough you add the antibody and you allow the antibody to start diffusing in the gel just like rid and odt when this occurs now at the point where the two are when the when the antigen and antibody they come in uh, contact with each other you will develop you will see a precipitation uh, present over there now seeing the precipitation you can say that but that particular antigen is basically or that particular protein is basically available in the uh, reaction in the in the serum or not so if the if, if a particular antibody can bind to a particular kind of an antigen and if that antigen is absent then you will not see any type of precipitation but if it is present you will see a precipitation this is generally done to find the presence and absence of a protein so suppose you want to identify a particular protein okay present to be present in the serum or not now what you do is you take that you take the mixture of you take the serum and you add it in the well now when you add it up add up in the well it may happen uh, that it, it is always that the serum contains more than one type of protein now what you are interested in identifying the protein a so you do the electrophoresis and after the electrophoresis you say that the proteins have bifurcated according to their size right the smaller proteins at the back the, bar, the larger proteins at the uh, towards the cathode cathodic region right uh, so uh, then what you do you develop the trough and you put the antibodies in the trough that could bind only to protein a so after you add the antibodies for, uh, specific for the protein A, what will happen through the trough the antibodies will diffuse and you will if you see a precipitation, uh, if you see a region where there is uh, a precipitation is there, then you can say the serum contains a protein A and if there is no precipitation then you can say that serum does not contain the protein A. This is a basic example of uh, how immunoelectrophoresis is being done in order to identify the presence and absence of a particular protein or any antigen. So basically it is just a qualitative assay where you can just identify the presence and absence of a particular uh, protein or an antigen that is being into the case. Now if you want to use a electrophoresis based method for the identification of the concentration you go for rocket immunoelectrophoresis.
for us is now the phenomena remains the same what you do is you add in the gel the antibodies and in the well you add the antigen and you allow the electrophoresis to occur so when the electrophoresis is occurring what will happen is the antigen and antibodies when they are when they react with each other they will form a precipitation now uh, as the antigen moves outside the well uh, you will see the uh, till the movement till the till the point where all the antigen binds to the antibody when all the antigens bind to the antibody till that moment you will see the precipitation ring this uh, takes a shape of a big scar like pro pro projection which we called as a rocket right just like a propulsion that you see outside the rocket engines same type of a propulsion can be seen outside the well the length of the uh, precipitation is uh, uh, from is is from which you try to identify the concentration of the antigen so if you want to go for an electrophoresis based method for the identification of the concentration you go for rocket electrophoresis however whenever you are doing electrophoresis you need to keep in mind electrophoresis based immunoprecipitation reaction can only be done if the antigen is or is carrying a charge if the antigen isn't carrying any charge then electrophoresis based immunoprecipitation reaction cannot occur right now we'll start talking about the uh, next uh, classified version of the immunoassay that is the agglutination reaction now when we talk about the agglutination reaction the principle and working is just same as that of immunoprecipitation the only difference lies in the fact is here the antigen is of the particulate nature and not the soluble nature right the antigen is of the particulate nature and not of the soluble nature that is the one of the basic and the only difference between the agglutination and the precipitation based immunological assays now the antibodies that does this particular job of aggregating the particulate antigens are called as a glutenins rest of the things remains the same as that of the immunoprecipitation reaction now we will talk about the various types of assays or techniques that are available for this particular process now one of the very uh, known processes is basically called as the bacterial agglutination now bacterial agglutination is basically done to diagnose the presence of an infection now in this diagram we are talking about a very well known uh, diagnostic kit called as the vidal test which is basically done for the identification of salmonella typhi which is the causative organism for the disease called as typhoid now uh, the principle behind the bacterial agglutination lies in the fact that whenever there is a bacterial infection this host produces antibodies and in the bacterial agglutination what we try to identify is not the bacteria but we try to identify whether the antibodies against that organism is present in the serum of not because if the antibodies are present then we can say that definitely there is an infection because due to that particular infection uh, the host immune system is producing the uh, antibodies now bacterial agglutination or the based serum agglutination based reaction is basically done for the infections which are blood grown in nature because both basically which are blood grown in nature they have they are the one that elicits the high concentration high production of the antibodies because most of the pathogens they have learned to cheat our immune system by getting inside the host cell so all those organisms which cannot get inside the host cell will definitely come in contact with the wbcs and definitely there will be production of the antibodies will be there so what do we do is we take the serum and as you can see that uh, there are uh, the in the lower diagram where you can see the circles which are entitled as o h a h and b h and the two c's are the control so what you do is you take the person uh, the patient serum and you add up in all these all these wells and uh, 
and then what you do is you take the uh, vials which contains the salmonella type B antigen that is the antigen that has been uh, taken from the salmonella type B. Now there are various strains of salmonella type B available when we call them as O, H, A, H and B, H and when you add these antigens in the wells and if there is a uh, agglutination then definitely you can say the person is infected with which kind of S type B. On the other hand the same process can be used for identification of the title value that is the concentration. If the antibody production is very high, there will be a higher amount of agglutination even in the diluted sample, right? So what you need to do if you want to find out the concentration, you take the serum and you dilute it, right? If the agglutination is occurring even in the highest diluted condition then you can say the infection rate is very very high and if there is no agglutination at, at after a particular tighter value then you can say the infection has either ceased or there is a very less volume of infection is present in the patient so Bacterial agglutination is a way of diagnosing the infection or by the identification of the presence of antibodies towards that particular kind of an infection. In the same way, since agglutination reactions are much preferred than precipitation reaction, since they are more, uh, what you can say, more sensitive than the uh, uh, precipitation based immunological assays, Therefore, uh, we, uh, we try to develop strategies where we can uh, make an agglutination reaction possible even for the soluble antigens. Yes, it is possible to do so because uh, so far we may be thinking that soluble antigens will only give precipitation reaction. But then we have come to the swab where we can make the soluble antigens give the precipitate, uh, sorry, the agglutination reactions as well. Now, how do we do so? We do so by immobilizing the antigen over an insoluble agent. So, if you see the diagram, here we have taken RBC. RBC here is an insoluble agent and to this RBC, we treat this RBC with chromium chloride or tannic acid. On doing so, it becomes an competent cell to absorb, to adsorb basically the antigen over its surface. And when antigen gets uh, adhered to the surface of the RBCs, we incubate them with the specific kind of an antibody. When we incubate them with a specific kind of an antibody, the antibody is start binding to it and then you can see the agglutination reaction. So, these antigens were soluble in nature since they are soluble in nature they were not able to show agglutination reaction so what you did is you just made them adsorbed over the surface of RBC RBC now becomes insoluble so the antigen becomes insoluble and since the antigen becomes insoluble or they can show now the agglutination type of reaction so uh, this, this is basically called as a passive agglutination or indirect agglutination where you are using a soluble antigen to show the agglutination reaction. Uh, we have come ahead of using RBCs. Now we are using the latex, latex based beads that is L-A-T-E-X based beads for the uh, development of the passive agglutination reaction. Uh, this is uh, used, uh, the latex ba based uh, agglutination reaction is basically used in one of the very common example that we are talking about that is the pregnancy kit. Now uh, the, diag the diagnosis of pregnancy is based upon the use of latex bead or the absence of agglutination. What we here use is uh, the, uh, the reverse of agglutination reaction, here we use the absence of agglutination reaction to diagnose the presence of the pregnancy in the female. Now what we do over here is there is a kit, the pregnancy kit that is available in the market. They contain basically two components. Number one, the latex particle 
which is coated with HCG. Now, what is HCG? HCG is human chronic gonadotropin that is basically produced in the pregnant women. So, what they what uh, what the uh, companies do is they provide in the kit the latest beads over which the HCG is being coated, and the another next component that they provide in the kit is the anti hcg antibodies right so they provide an anti hcg antibodies these antibodies can bind to the hcg now uh, what do, what is being done in this particular uh, immunological assay is you take the strip and over the strip already the uh, latex is being immobilized and antibody is being added and the urine sample is also added so over the strip there are three things available the urine sample from the uh, female and then you have the anti hcg antibodies and then you have the latex where latex particle latex particle uh, which are coated with the hcg now if the person is not pregnant if the female is not pregnant what you will see is the presence of agglutination now why agglutination will occur because since there is no hcg available in the urine sample the antibodies against the hcg that is present over the strip will go and bind to the latex particle and cause the cross linking as you can see in the diagram and since there is a cross linking there you can see the agglutination reaction but if the female is pregnant, what happens is there is the presence of HCG in a very minute amount in the urine sample and the antibody that is being present over the strip will go and bind to these HCGs that is present in the urine and then because of which the antibodies will not be available or will be available in a very negligible amount to bind to the latex particle since they cannot bind to the latex particle they cannot cause the cross linking since they cannot cause the cross linking there will be no agglutination and the absence of agglutination shows that the female is pregnant right so the absence of agglutination also gives us the information for the presence and absence of those antigens which are very minute in amount Right, so if an antigen is a very minute in an amount, the absence of agglutination is a very efficient method of diagnosing such thing. Even when we are talking about the dopings that are being done over the uh, athletes and the sports person is based upon in, is based upon the absence of agglutination reaction. So there are a number of essays that are available for the agglutination reaction and precipitation reaction which are being utilized for the diagnosis of number of things right from qualitative to both quantitative in nature so uh, you need to keep in mind all the different basic principles that are involved in immunological assays and you can definitely overpolate it or manipulate it or exploit it for your own personal desired method of understanding the various phenomena right from discovering the presence and absence to its concentration so thank you for listening to me and if you have any questions regarding the immunoprecipitation and agglutination based immunological assays the details of contact is you can see over your screen don't hesitate to contact to me and ask your question i'm always ready to do so and in, uh, we'll definitely look on the more advanced immunological essays in my next video Till then, take care and have a great time ahead.